Good day everyone, my name is Nafneet Anand from Vaisajka Local and Global. Today here in Sydney we are meeting Mr. Andrew Giles, the Shadow Minister for Immigration and Multicultures. He's flown down from Melbourne and we're getting a chance to see him. Mr. Giles, welcome to the show. Evelyn, it's so good to be here with you. If you were not a politician, what would you have been? Oh, that's <laughs> a good question. I would have liked to have been a cricketer, but uh, I wasn't good enough. Um, previously, I worked as a lawyer, and, and I found that work really enjoyable. But uh, can I say this, Navneet? I'm very happy um, being a, a, a politician and a member of Anthony Albanese's team at the moment. Tell us something about yourself before joining the politics. Well, it's, uh, as I said a moment ago, I, I used to be a lawyer, uh, and uh, I enjoyed that work enormously. I enjoyed the challenge of problem solving, of working with people to understand what was important to them and seeing if I could work with them to solve the problem. And I think that was a very good preparation for life as a politician because I really see the challenge as the same, except that now I'm trying to solve much bigger problems on behalf of our entire community rather than for individuals. Being a public figure, probably not many would know how has your childhood been? <laughs> well, uh, like probably many public figures, uh, I'm probably more shy than I'd like to be. Uh, I had a very happy childhood, uh, mostly in Melbourne, uh, almost all, all in Melbourne. Uh, I'm one of two children. I have a younger brother. Um, he's the success of the family. He's a doctor, a paediatrician. Uh, and I, I think I had a very, a very idyllic childhood um, playing sport on the streets and I had the opportunity also to, um, to live in London for a part of my childhood when uh, my family moved there for work, which was a great experience as well. You were just talking about you being a lawyer before coming into politics. I think you were the lawyer for the refugees who were stuck in Tampa. If you could tell us a bit about that saga, that crisis that happened. Yeah, well, this is 20 years ago, Navneet, but it's made a very big impact on my life, but much more importantly on Australia. We've always been a welcoming country as a, as a modern nation since the Second World War, but something changed, I think, when John Howard was the Prime Minister and we dealt with the prospect of uh, the refugee arrivals, the 430-odd people on the Tampa who sought to claim asylum here, and there was a very big standoff, as, as many of your viewers will recall. I was concerned that these people were having a fairly fundamental right taken away from them. The right to come before a court and put their case before it. The right to seek safety. And we are also 20 years on from Australia's involvement in the tragic war in Afghanistan. And of course these people on the Tampa were fleeing that very conflict. So I think now about some of the big decisions we made there and about how Australia can be a moral leader in a world where too many people are forced to flee their homes, where too many people uh, face persecution in their home country, and to think about how we can be uh, an example to the rest of the world, as we weren't back in Tampa. I understand your concerns that people, the genuine people I say who are fleeing out of the country, did have the genuine concerns to get a shelter in the other country, but at the same time probably government had in mind that there may be people without documents that may be getting the benefit of coming up with these people, which could be antisocial. Could that be one of the reasons? Well, look, uh, what I think about these issues is, and we always need integrity in our immigration system in every aspect of it, and appropriate checks and balances. But I think the story of the refugees on the Tampa is a story of great contribution to society. Um, many are going on to graduate school in the United States and making great contributions. But the contributions they are making are to New Zealand, not to Australia. So I think there's a loss there. Uh, I think it's easy to, to demonise individuals, but what we really need to do as a government is to have a framework in place that is, that is both generous, but also protects our, our border Our borders, appropriately. Yeah. To get that balance right, and, and I certainly don't think we had the balance right uh, 20 years ago. So what was the end result of your practice that you fought for them at the time, so what were the results that we found? Well, we, uh, we ultimately lost that case. Uh, we lost that case uh, in the appeal court, although we won at the, before a judge at first instance, but the decision was made by the government to effectively change the legal framework, which meant that the, the court case went away. And for me, 
in the case, but also in terms of what I wanted to do. That was a very big moment because, again, it showed me that as a lawyer, you can maybe, if you're good, deliver justice for an individual. But if you want to achieve justice across the community, that's about changing the laws through being involved in formal politics, being involved in government and sitting in the parliament. Were you involved with Dr Hanif's case as, case as well? No, I wasn't. I, I paid close attention to that, but I only in terms of, again, showing what can happen if we don't have the checks and balances in our systems right to make sure that individuals who are subject to um, quite strict regimes aren't at the mercy of those regimes, that they can exercise all their civil rights and not be arbitrarily and unfairly detained. There are a few months left. Mm -hmm. I think the federal elections are coming on in the uh, first half of uh, 2022. What are the policies from Labor uh, when it comes in relation with the multicultural society? It's such an important question. I was really thrilled to be asked by Anthony Albanese to take on this role um, because I represent a very diverse community and because I think we can do better to harness the extraordinary diversity that is modern Australia and also to recognise that multiculturalism in Australia is changing. It's changing every day when new people arrive, when new communities are formed. Now, one of the things that I've been really careful to do, Navneet, is as the Shadow Minister for Multicultural Affairs, never to presume to speak for multicultural communities, but to make sure that all of their voices can be heard. And in terms of the pandemic, I think we've seen how really important that is, how critical it is that everyone can access information through trusted sources, such as the one that, uh, that we're involved in, in producing right now, to understand that there are some gaps in our systems, whether it's in government or in communications that mean that many people haven't had the access to information, often to stay safe. That we haven't understood how much we rely upon community leaders to keep our whole communities together, safe and connected. So a lot of the policies that we will be talking about as we get a bit closer to the election reflect on my understanding of the lessons of the pandemic. Another thing that I'm proud that we have already done is to commit to an annual multicultural statement, which we did for the first time last year, to look at how Commonwealth government decisions, particularly around the budget, impact upon multicultural communities and new migrant communities. We'll be releasing uh, uh, this year's in the very near future. And it's these understandings that, that really inform some of the decisions that we will be taking to the next election and reflecting our close listening to multicultural communities in Sydney, in Melbourne, in other capital cities, but increasingly in regional communities too, where often the needs of new communities are very different than in our major centres. You know, the Australian public is intelligent enough to choose whom they want to be their elected government. Once the policies are out, then it's much easier for them to decide which way to go. Talking about the parental visa, mm. in your view, was it delivered properly well or would it have been different if you were in the power at that time? Well, I think we've seen a number of issues with visa processing under this government. Some related to obviously the particular circumstances of the pandemic, others related frankly to some decisions of government that haven't recognised that we are a multicultural society, that haven't recognised that 50% of Australians were either born overseas or have a parent who's born overseas, which doesn't understand also that so many Australians meet their life partner overseas as well. So with both parental visas and partner visas, we've seen some shocking stories of delay, shocking stories of families that have been separated and the anxiety of people being separated through the, the last 18 months has been something that I've really struggled with as a, as a local member dealing with very concerned constituents. So these are things that we feel could and should have been done very differently and these are some of the most critical policy questions that we're working on in Labor uh, to take to the next election. The borders were closed uh, due to the pandemic situation. Obviously, uh, Australian government wanted to safeguard the Australian citizens first, but number of uh, temporary visa holders and students who were stuck overseas, probably they are given a chance to come back to Australia slowly and slowly. Because of Omricon, I think that has been delayed for another two weeks, but hope sustains life. We will get them back sooner rather than later. 
tourism is another industry mm. that need to be worked on to have the cycle of economy going wonderfully well. How would you be taking the different if you are given a chance to take some decisions on? Look, Navid, the, the first thing that I need to say is that we've been consistent throughout the pandemic in saying that these decisions should all be based on public health advice. Um, so we're not interested in questioning um, that advice as it's been received by government. We think it's absolutely critical that we stay safe. But we also think that there's a lot of work that could and should have been done about preparing for a return to people coming here. International students, we know that that's our third biggest export earner. And there are some significant issues that haven't really been dealt with. We think back to early in the pandemic when um, government ministers told people to go home. We also know that we didn't extend the sort of supports that other OECD economies did to people who were stranded here during the pandemic. So we're concerned about what this says to people who uh, may wish to come here and have read these reports or concerned about friends. We're also concerned that uh, a rise in racism during the pandemic wasn't addressed quickly or decisively enough by the government uh, when we know that you know, in difficult times we do often see an upswing in these behaviours and they need to be dealt with. So these are some issues which we feel still need to be properly addressed by national government. But we also think we've got to look at the great opportunities Australia is going to have as the world reopens. The great national, uh, sorry, natural beauty that we have in so many places, the great facilities, and the fact that, you know, by and large, thanks in particular the efforts of some of our state leaders that we've shown us to be a particularly safe place through the pandemic. So a national plan to get tourism going as well as, um, of course, in national education is something that's absolutely critical. The priorities that I have as the Shadow Minister for Multicultural Affairs and in terms of my work in immigration with Senator Keneally, it's a very, very big priority to get this right and to enable loving partners to be able to begin their lives together or to carry on their lives together in Australia. You know, during my conversation with Minister uh, Alex Hawk, he has assured that there will be good regulations and news coming out sooner rather than later. So let's uh, look forward to that as well. So that families are reunited. The level of stress and anxiety is less than what it is at the moment. What will be the Labour Party's position on teaching of different languages such as Mandarin, Hindi, Japanese, Arabic at mm. primary as well as the high school? It's a really important question and I'll be very careful now and, be, uh, and make clear that I'm not speaking on behalf of my colleague Tanya Plibersek who is responsible for education, but I might make a few observations. I've been really worried at the university level about the threats to language programs, uh, in particular the threat to the teaching of Hindi um, at Australian universities and I spent a lot of time working with La Trobe University to make sure that they can continue uh, together with the ANU to offer Hindi at Australian universities. In terms of supporting languages um, more broadly, I, I think we all recognise that the study of East and South Asian languages is, is really important in terms of who we are. Now part of that involves better support for some community-based language schools. Part of it involves recognising the great work that's done by organisations like the Victorian School of Languages, which supports the teaching of languages across um, secondary and primary schools, not just in Victoria, but in a number of jurisdictions. I think we do have a national interest in seeing Australians able to speak to our major trading partners in their own languages, to not to assume that everyone in the world should speak English. And we haven't done very well at that historically. It's something that we really need to work towards and to make sure that a good suite of language options are available for Australian students to learn as primary school students, as secondary school students, and to be part of tertiary studies as well. Learning a language is an asset for any country's citizens at all. Being bilingual or sometimes knowing more than two to three languages, because me being born in India mm -hmm. and calling Australia my home, have been able to speak four different languages, Hindi, Punjabi, English, as well as Urdu. Mm. That gives me a chance to go and converse with a wider community altogether. If languages are taught to the Australian kids, right from the bottom, would help us in getting more business, and as we said, uh, talking to the countries where we do the major businesses with. Anything else that you have in mind that you want to tell our audiences before we mm. go? 
Well, look, I think the main message that I'd like to reiterate, Navneet, is firstly what a pleasure it is to be part of this conversation, such a wide-ranging conversation. And I really see my role, as I said earlier, as being someone who ensures that all voices are heard in Australia. That's in the media, but particularly in public life, in politics. No one person can encapsulate the extraordinary diversity that is our great country, the world's most successful multicultural society. But we can't rely on that present fact to secure that future. And a big part of my job is to be a really active listener to all the voices in the Australian community, to better understand what matters to them, to better understand what opportunities we face as a nation, what opportunities they face as individuals or communities. So I'd say to all your viewers and listeners, please reach out to me and I look forward to hearing your views. And Navneet, I hope we can have this conversation again soon. Absolutely. Before I wrap up, what's on your wish list? Win for the election? <laughs> An Albanese Labor government <laughs> is, uh, is all I want for Christmas. It's all I want for the new year. It's all I want for our country and the opportunity to make a bigger difference um, to this great country. You know, may the best team win and let the people judge who they want to be there as their comment. Thank you so much for your time coming and chatting with us. Yeah, today we have talked with Andrew Giles, the Shadow Minister of Multicultural Teams, and I am your Nafneet. Once again, thank you so much. Thank you, Nadeh. Fiji Times. We were the Times.